Comrade Kim Jong-il spent a lifetime dedicated to the cause of socialism and communism. His exploits as a leader and commander, as well as a theoretician, is unparalleled. Since his early days to his very last, he was thrust onto the front line of politics and revolution in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Under his leadership as General Secretary of the Workers' Party and Chairman of the National Defence Commission, he had to guide the revolution through its most challenging period, the arduous march. Despite all of his works, Kim Jong-il is remembered in the West as the man with the taste for cognac who shot 39 under par in golf and invented the hamburger. Is there any veracity to these claims? According to a great deal of articles by Western media outlets, these outlandish ideas come from Kim Jong-il's official state-approved biography. As such, the following information presented in this video is from the condensed biography of Kim Jong-il as approved by the DPRK. I highly recommend that you yourself read it, not only to gain a deep, deeper insight into the life and times of Kim Jong-il, but to also dispel such outlandish myths like the ones previously mentioned. It must be further noted that the following video is not a complete account of the life of Kim Jong-il. It should be considered a general overview. A great number of volumes have been published detailing his life, including the condensed single volume biography. A lot of information has naturally been omitted for the sake of providing the viewer with a succinct and clear overview. For more information, you can find a link to the full biography in the description. Without further ado, I present to you a short biography of the life and times of comrade Kim Jong-il. Enjoy. Kim Jong-il was born on February the 16th, 1942, in Ryangang Province, Korea. His father, Comrade Kim Il-sung, and mother, Kim, Kim Yong-suk, had been ardently anti-Japanese fighters since their own early years. In the 1940s, of course, were the years of the Second World War. The Hitlerite Nazis were marching all over Europe, and Japanese Emperor Hirohito was trying to bring all of the Pacific under his control. The anti-Japanese guerrillas had been fighting valiantly against the armies of the Emperor. It was in these times that Kim Jong-il was born, on the dawn of the Korean Revolution and amongst the ruins of the old feudal society. One account from 1946 tells the story of Kim Jong-il's great-grandfather presenting him with a writing brush. Quote, your grandfather wrote, aim high, and your father, quote, liberation of Korea. What will you write? Kim Jong-il, taking the brush, wrote, long live General Kim Il-sung. Despite being the son of the liberator of Korea, he in fact did not receive any special treatment in his upbringing and education. He attended school with books wrapped in paper and simple clothes, just like any other student. Despite his extreme young age at the time, Kim Jong-il nonetheless was constantly exposed to the building of a new career. His early life was never away from politics, and one could indeed conclude that it was thanks to this early exposure which led Kim Jong-il down the path of a revolutionary and politician. The Fatherland Liberation War cast a dark shadow once again over the Korean Peninsula, which still to this day hasn't quite been lifted. The war machine was sprung to life again, however, the DPRK was faced with a new enemy, the United States of America. 
With the outbreak of the war in 1950, Kim Jong-il, who up to then had only experienced fully the building of a new society, now had to face the horrors of war. An eight-year-old child receiving a first-hand view of pain and suffering. For the first two years of the war, Kim Jong-il was separated from his father. However, in 1952, the two were reunited. For the rest of the war, he stayed with Kim Il-sung at the headquarters of the Korean People's Army and witnessed his lengthy sessions of planning and developing military strategies and tactics. It can be clearly concluded that Kim Jong-il was a product of his environment at that time. His exposure to politics, war and military tactics at such a young age, in my opinion, cemented his life's journey. One could almost say that it was his destiny to become a politician and to work for the revolution. In 1954, Kim Jong-il entered Pyongyang Middle School No. 1 at the age of 12. It was during this time that Kim Jong-il's taste for reading really began to shine. He reportedly read a great number of books in his teenage years, including sociopolitical theory and culture. By the late 1950s, he was heavily involved in the Children's Union, and in 1957, he was elected to the position of Vice Chairman of the Democratic Youth League. In 1960, Kim Jong-il entered Kim Il-sung University to study a course in economics. On his first day, he climbed Ryongnam Hill, where the university was located, and recited the following poem, which he had written. Quote, As I stand on Ryongnam Hill at sunrise, the land of three thousand ri greets my eyes. Learning the leader's great idea, I will be the master of revolution in this land, Korea. O Korea, I will add glory to thee. On the road of Juche, I will be firm and steady, under the guidance of the great leader. Braving the raging waves and storms, I will lead Korea into the future. O Korea, I will make thee famous. I will go on forever with the cause of the sun that shines all over the whole world. I will bring about the era of communism when the red glow of Juche will cover the earth. O Korea, my Korea. During his studies at Kim Il-sung University, Kim Jong-il was very attentive to his studies. He was noted to have gone beyond the syllabus of his course. For example, in one examination regarding the history of the international labour movement, he discussed in depth, as explained in the syllabus, the disintegration of the Second International. However, he did not limit himself to just explaining certain reasons, but actually further gave his own opinions regarding the revision of Marx and Engels' ideals by revisionists such as Bernstein. Furthermore, Kim Jong-il put a lot of effort into developing the ideological understanding of his fellow students. He was very active in regards to the class education of them in particular, helping to develop their working class consciousness. Also, it was around this time that reactionaries such as Khrushchev were screaming about personality cults. While he trampled all over the memory and works of J.V. Stalin, Kim Jong-il denounced this trend during talks with his fellow classmates, pointing out that the leader is not just an individual, but a significant point of unity for the working class. In 1961, at the age of 19, Kim Jong-il became a member of the Workers' Party of Korea. Since his first day in the party, he was devoted as ever before in helping develop the ideological unity of the party members. In 1963, an article titled A Communist Student Collective of Our Times was published in Minju Chongyom, detailing the excellent comradely unity of Kim Jong-il's class. Also, around this time, Kim Jong-il wrote a number of essays discussing imperialism, revisionism and the place of philosophy in the world, and naturally drew heavily from the works 
of Marx, Engels and Lenin, as well as Kim Il-sung. Also, Kim Jong-il began accompanying Kim Il-sung on field guidance trips to farms, factories and enterprises all over Korea in order to learn in depth the practicalities of building an economic, cultural and military power. In 1964, Kim Jong-il was posted to the position as a member of the Central Committee of the Workers' Party of Korea. In his work, he saw to it that all the departments and organisations of the party were thoroughly educated in the theories of Kim Il-sung and worked to mould the party into the party of the Juche idea. Kim Jong-il also began to take a deep interest in the military of the DPRK. He considered it an important task to turn the entire country into an impenetrable fortress. To do this, he expressed the importance of arming the entire people and, in effect, making Korea a guerrilla base. It was also of great importance for him to defend the nation from surprise attacks. He pointed out historical examples of when even great military powers were toppled by such attacks. In regards to arming the people... He noted the examples during the anti-Japanese revolution of the entire people of guerrilla zones turning out to fight the imperialists, not just the guerrilla army. The unity of the people and army is what allowed for, de for decisive victories against the imperialists, even when they were outmatched, outflanked and outgunned. Because of these efforts, the people and the Korean People's Army were able to respond efficiently and rapidly in 1968 during the capture of the US warship El Pueblo and the shooting down of the spy plane EC-121 in 1969. It was also in the mid to late 1960s that Kim Jong-il began to conduct visits with the leader to other countries. Also, he considered the development of art, music and literature onto a new and revolutionary level as an important task, developing these areas to better reflect the contemporary thoughts and passions of the working people was of significant importance to him and as such he worked to provide guidance in their development. In 1971 he saw to it that the development of new revolutionary sites showcasing the feats of comrade Kim Il-sung's long career and the history of the Korean Revolution. Several revolutionary museums were opened and a number of bronze statues were erected of Kim Il-sung in order to immortalise him in the land in which he guided its liberation. In 1973, he began an upsurge in automisation of heavy industry, narrowing of the difference between light and heavy labour and industrial and agricultural work as well as eliminating the reactionary gender-based outlook of women's roles within the home. These ideals went on to be immortalised as part of the ongoing technological revolution of automisation, mechanisation and all-round scientific advances in the methods of commodity production. <laughs>